President of uh, today's session, Professor Gopalan Kutti, dignitaries on the dais, my dear friends. I'm extremely grateful to the kind words spoken about me and my work by Professor Nabodri and uh, Sora Madam and Reverend Father. This is the second time that I am here in this great hall. I have written this book in order to generate a discussion and a debate in the country. I must say that I am quite happy with the kind of debate that has been generated so far in different parts of the country. Now, we have had uh, the release of Malayalam translation of my essays in my book. In January, that is next month, a translation of Hindi, Telugu and Tamil are going to be released. I am sure after that, the debate will be much more intense. What I feel heartening is in the last three, four days my friend Sudhir had organized gatherings in many educational institutions. I have been going around to colleges and higher secondary schools. So it is very heartening that the younger generation is very aware. They have a lot of clarity about the situation in the country. And they are also very clear about where India should go and wa what path it should take. I am saying this because I did not expect. It is very heartening because I, maybe like many of you, I also had this feeling that young people don't bother so much about what's happening in the country. They probably don't read much. They don't care much. But it was a pleasant surprise to me that they do care a lot. They know a lot. They have very clear ideas of where India should head. Today, they may not have many avenues to express themselves. But if you go and talk to them, touch them, they are quite expressive. You will be astonished at the clarity that they have. I'm just coming from a, a school. And I met about 150 or 200 girl students. You should have seen the, the, the way. When I encouraged them to express, it's astonishing. So that gives me a lot of hope. If we have to be honest, the kind of situation the country is in today to 
to no small degree we are also responsible for it but i have therefore a lot of hope that the younger generation the next generation will not probably tolerate this kind of a politics this kind of a repression this kind of a marginalization that we see today we are in a new india that's what the government tells us that's what the ruling party tells us that's what the leadership of the government and the ruling party tell us what defines this new india there are many things that define this new india but one thing is clear this new india is based on an idea that justifies repression and inequality i am not here to stand in front of you and say that before new india came about there was no repression or no inequality there was repression there was inequality in old india also for the past 40 years 50 years 60 years there was repression there was inequality but the the speciality of new india is it chooses to be repressive it is not by accident it chooses to be repressive and it justifies inequality it thinks that inequality is good i'll tell you why i think so and in what way new india tries to justify inequality we are talking about repression of the marginalized and i want to make a little amendment to the phrasing that it is not only repressive of the marginalized but it is increasing the size of the marginalized new and new people are new and new sections are being pushed into the marginalized category that is the speciality of new india let me draw your attention to a recent speech by one of the members of parliament in the new building immediately probably within days of the new building's inauguration somebody called ramesh biduri the kind of language he used the kind of adjectives that he used to describe another member of parliament hailing from the largest minority of this country that defines repression in new india and what is much more striking than what he said this is important to define to understand new india not a single person responsible in the government or in the state apparatus or from the ruling party had said a single word to condemn what that bidori had said in parliament nobody i'm just not talking about uh, you know the other person who is a, who is the president of the wrestling federation what uh, 
the women residents have uh, accused him of and he is being shielded, nobody questions him. You know, I'm not talking about all that. But just look at this. In an open session of India's parliament for the first time, somebody uses that kind of a language, that kind of a adjectives to a fellow member of parliament belonging to a minority community of India. Nobody says anything. No action is taken till today. Nobody are condemns it. Not even a notice of show cause or an explanation is sought from that member of parliament. This is New India. It, it justifies it. It supports it. You know, we are in what is called Azadi Ka Amrit Kaal. We have celebrated Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsa. We are in the Amrit Kaal. It started on 15th of August 2022. That morning, when we kicked off, when we started the Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsa, People who were not accused, not charged, people who were convicted of raping a woman and killing her unborn child were released all at once in Gujarat. And they were garlanded on their release and taken in a procession and felicitated. This is another mark of the repression that characterizes New India. As Professor Nambudri had said, I, I do not want to go into the technicalities. But I have to say at least this much. When I said in the opening remarks here that not only there are marginalized sections, but new people are joining the ranks of the marginalized. I meant that For the first time since the 1990s, a large number of people have fallen from being middle class into poverty trap. For the first time, sir. It never happened before. And of course, you might say the government tells us that India is the fastest growing economy, India has become the fifth largest economy, India's growth rate is high, and all that. We'll come to that. I mean, today, there's one more characteristic of new India, which is based on lies and half truths. I'll give one small example. I don't want to go into the details of, you know, economic data and all that, but I'll give you one example. One, of course, no data that is put out by this government is credible. No data that is, that is put out by this government is credible. Every data point that this government puts out is suspect. This is the first time ever that the once respected statistical architecture of India has come under doubt, not only in India, but throughout the world. I don't know how many of you remember, but 100 prominent economists from the entire world have written an open letter to the government of India about why and how the Indian statistical architecture is not credible anymore. 
I'll give you one example, simple one. Sir, till some time ago, a one kilometer of a four-lane road is one kilometer of a four-lane road. Today in New India, a one kilometer of a four-lane road is four kilometers. That is the credibility of the Indian statistical architecture. Nothing that the government says is believable anymore. I'll give you one more example and stop this. So sometime back you must have seen there was World Hunger Index. World Hunger Index was released and India was placed far, far below at 111 out of 125 countries. The government was raging with anger. You have seen ministers, you had seen members of the ruling party and so many other people saying that, you know, we just can't trust these people. It is anti-India report. It is full, the, the methodology is wrong, etc., etc. And I don't know how many of you might have seen it, but one responsible minister, a senior minister of this government, said that you know how these people compute the uh, hunger index? And that minister gives an elaborate explanation. That minister said, you know, I woke up today at 4.30 in the morning, I rushed to the airport. I had to catch a flight to, you know, go to Kerala, deliver a lecture. And from there I had to go to Mumbai, deliver another lecture and attend another meeting. I did not have time to eat my breakfast, nor did I have time to eat my lunch. So I was running around. Then when I was running around, when I was in a, in a, in a car, my phone rings and I pick up a, my, the phone and the voice from the other side asks me, are you hungry? I said, yes, I'm hungry. Oh, then the phone line is cut. So they've noted that I'm hungry. And that is how they're computing hunger index. And just because I was busy, I did not eat my breakfast, I did not eat my lunch. I said I was hungry and these people are saying that India is a hungry country. That is the kind of trivialization of New India. But if the government is serious about it, if the government really is honest about it, if the government really thinks that India is not having any hunger, but all this data put out by the World Hunger Index is just false. Within days, within days, the Prime Minister announces that 80 crore people will receive free food grains for another five years. Why? If nobody is hungry, if employment is wonderful, if inflation was under control, why do you have to do this? If marginalization has happened many years ago and there are marginalized people and no more people are being marginalized, then this initiative is not necessary. I'll give you one more example of marginalization and then we'll come to the kind of repression and the oppression and the violence that is taking place. Just give me another minute to mention one more. I don't know how many of you remember, in 22 beginning, there was an advertisement for recruitment in railway department. They were called NTPC jobs, non-technical professional categories. Non-technical. It is a euphemism for menial work. That's all. Sweepers and, and things like that. 
the number of jobs that were advertised were 35000 sir there were 1 crore 25 lakh applicants for 35 jobs 35000 jobs 1 crore 25 lakh crore applications there was rioting in uttar pradesh and bihar probably you remember so what are these people this 1 crore 25 lakh people trying to compete for 35000 non technical professional category jobs menial jobs they are the newly marginalized sections marginalized sections were there and to their ranks are swelling with these new entrants poverty they were first time since the 1990s there was a net addition to the number of poor people in this country and the young people as i said this is just a, a symptom but if you look at the broad data is about 24% of the young people of this country are today jobless this is another large chunk of people who are newly getting marginalized and now let us shift for a while to the the larger chunk of marginalized people as i said marginalization and state repression is not new but in new india marginalization and repression are being sought to be justified that these are good this happens of course and it happens because this new india so has a different view of what our reality is according to the the present ideology this country belongs to people belonging to one faith every other section today in this country is a marginalized section everybody else and even among the so called hindu majority this 1 crore 25 lakh people they are marginalized and the way the state used bullets and lathis on this 35 crore 25 lakh people who were competing for 35000 ntpc jobs you just have to recall to believe what kind of a repression that was unleashed any dissenting voice not only dissenting voice not only people who are questioning but people who are suffering people who have no opportunities and the newly marginalized they are the targets of state repression today there are laws in place for instance the uap the uap law there there are there are some advocates here aziz is here i can recognize him so tell me what is the what is the fundamental principle of natural justice that if you accuse me i am innocent till i am proven guilty and who has to prove me guilty is the burden of the prosecution the principle of natural justice is not that if you accuse me and i have to prove that i am innocent rather than you proving that i am guilty isn't it 
that is the anywhere universal but in india today the uapa which is being used against the marginalized sections and people who champion the marginalized sections it is their burden to prove that they are innocent it is not the burden of the prosecution to prove them guilty this is some departure which is astonishing shocking to the entire legal fraternity isn't it aziz it's surprising but our parliament doesn't question this our civil society doesn't question this our intelligentsia doesn't question this they raise they raise a couple of questions here and there but where is an organized resistance to this kind of a repression this kind of a state that we see today it is showing in terms of center state relations if a state is financially squeezed the state will have to that particular state will have to scream that's all other states don't scream for this state i'll give you one more example there is jammu and kashmir article 370 was read down when article 370 was read down when the political establishment of j and k its leadership its representatives former chief ministers members of parliament members of legislative assembly former members of legislative assembly former mem members of parliament former ministers and many many activists hundreds and hundreds of activists were arrested incarcerated house arrested not allowed to participate in the in the parliament proceedings nobody raised the question i would have at least been happy if when the lok sabha was in session other members stood up and said look where are my colleagues from J from jnk why are they not here they have to be here you you have, you have no right to arrest them okay you arrest them but you have to allow them to participate in the proceedings of the lok sabha otherwise you are denying the representation of those large number of people of that state isn't it do you recollect any member of parliament standing up in lok sabha and asking this question of where are my colleagues from jnk nobody asked i am not just talking about one political party i am talking about the entire state apparatus it is indifferent to marginalized sections marginalized people marginalized geographies marginalized states financially they are squeezed nobody talks today is what uh, razak about Eight months since Manipur started burning. Tell me, which state has any concern now about Manipur? Nobody. Nobody bothers. People have voted also after Manipur started burning. It made no difference. Now, sitting in in Kerala, I have noticed in my last few days, sir, that people think, let anything happen, we are safe. repression would come here this kind of an ideology would come here but let me say this in the form of a small warning as kerala's well-wisher that if it is happening in manipur please don't think it won't happen in kerala we are far away we are 
we don't have even one fellow who is representing this kind of ideology in our assembly or elected to Lok Sabha from here. No, please. Please don't be complacent about this. This kind of a repressive ideology, this kind of a repressive mentality, this kind of a othering mentality is working now here quite active. And for that to manifest itself in the form of representation in the assembly and in Lok Sabha doesn't take much time. Because after all, not resisting a repression is the most alarming symptom of any polity and any society. Now, I have given you the economic repression. I have given you the territorial repression. I have given you examples of individuals who are selectively repressed, those who are questioning. But the civil society is numb. And more and more people are joining the repressed sections. But the civil society is numb. This is the most alarming symptom of a society which has caught the virus. Your western guards are not going to save you from this virus. Your ideology is not going to save you from this virus. This virus is already present. I'll give you one example. Not from Kerala, but you can imagine, you can, if, if I give you this example, probably from tomorrow onwards, you will start looking for this symptom if there is present anywhere. Sir, I'll give you an example. I got into an Ola taxi sometime back in Hyderabad. And normally my habit is to ask the driver his name, where is he from, you know, just generally engage him in a chat for about two or three minutes and then start my own work or, you know, looking up the mails or answering uh, messages and things like that. So he told me that his name is some, some, something like Mohan or something and he's from Rai Seema of Andhra Pradesh. He came to Hyderabad and he's driving Ola taxi. Then I lost in my own work. And I noticed that the, the taxi was going very slowly, it was negotiating very slowly some narrow streets. And when I looked up, it was a narrow street and people were walking on the road because the street was narrow. So as it is, many roads in India, in many cities, they don't have pavements or footpaths. Even if there are pavements and footpaths, people don't use it, those footpaths and pavements for walking. They do many other things on the footpath, not walking much. So on some such a street, when the car was going slow, a lot of people were walking on the street. This boy turns behind to me and says, Sir, look at these Muslim fellows, they are walking on the road, they are not allowing us to go on the road. What is the correction? But he is not a member of the RSS. He is not somebody who has gone to Shakha. He is not a BJP person. He is not like, you know, Ramesh Bidori or somebody like that. He is not that. And he doesn't even come from an area where, you know, there are many Hindu-Muslim clashes and communal violence. No, it's a normal kind of a place. But where did he pick up this idea? Where did he pick up this thought and say that? Look at these guys. Where did he get this? That is the symptom of the virus. Now, start looking around yourselves from tomorrow. 
if you don't find such symptoms in your society i congratulate you but if you find be alarmed about it don't think this is nothing to do with it this is a very very potent symptom of a society getting sick and infected by this violence and one is that increasingly larger number of people are being categorized or added to the sections who are repressed number 1 number 2 people who are looking at some sections as those people that have to be repressed am i clear am i making it too complicated see there is a section which are repressed that section is growing what i told you and from the other side those people who want to repress these people their number is also growing don't think only rep- don't think first of all that repressed sections are static number 1 repressed sections are there they are growing new people are joining the ranks of the repressed second on the other side those people who want to repress them their number is also growing look at the danger added to this if i repress somebody but i feel guilty oh, i shouldn't have done it then there is some hope there but if i feel very confident that yes they have to be repressed who are these people anyway if i morally justify my repression of them that is even more dangerous gopal kutty master repressed increase of in the repressed people new recruits to the repressed sections and those who view these people as repressed or should be repressed the number is growing of these people not only that it is not just repression but morally justifying the repression look at the the multi pronged threat to the idea of india the idea of india of the founding fathers of the republic was a liberal state not a repressive state equal citizenry equal citizenship not unequal citizenship your region your language your religion are not qualifiers of your citizenship that is the idea of india today your religion today is becoming more and more a qualifying criteria for your citizenship not yet formally but informally in so many ways i will i have other 5 minutes and i'll finish that then we can have a discussion we can elaborate on some of the things see this is the first ever time that union government union council of ministers has no representation of the largest minority of this country it doesn't have representation not only the union council of ministers but the the ruling party which claims to be the largest political party in india not only in india but also the world 
the largest political party in the world, does not have a single member in its parliamentary party from the largest minority of this country. The largest state of this country, in that state, this largest political party, which is the ruling party of this country, has not a single member in the assembly belonging to the largest minority. Not only do they not have a member in the legislative party, processor, they have not given a ticket also to anybody who belongs to that largest single minority in this country. And in that particular state, that largest single minority in the country has a significant presence, much more than any other part of the country. This is the case in Gujarat for a long time. You will be surprised. Your neighbor Karnataka also, this largest political party, the ruling party, which was recently defeated, had no member belonging to the largest single minority in that state and in the country. Not only did they have the, a single member belonging to that community, but a single member, a single person belonging to that minority community was not even given a ticket. This is political repression. You have political repression. You have economic repression. You have economic and political discrimination of states, individuals. This is the creed of New India. I am not saying that old India did not have repression. It had. But it did not have, it did not formulate an ideology to justify repression, to justify the othering. Recently we heard uh, G20 was the Kutumbakam. The whole world is one family, except those fellows. They are not our Kutumbakam, but the entire world is. Oh, you belong to that religion. You are not. You have nothing to do with us. This is the hypocrisy. This is the the hard repression. It's not even any more soft repression. It is not any more unjustified repression, but it is a justified repression. They are justified morally. They are asserting a right to repress. I have just given you an example of one section. Look at many other sections. It could be Adivasis, it could be different religious minorities, it could be regions, it could be languages. It, could be, it is languages. I don't know how many of you are, if you, if you are, if you are aware that Many languages are now clubbed under the broad category of Hindi. Bhojpuri is Hindi, Kanyakubji is Hindi, Magadi is Hindi. They all were in the first, second, third, fourth senses. They were, they were treated differently. They were different languages. Why is this clubbed? They are all clubbed to say that the largest, predominant language of this country is Hindi, so better accept Hindi as the language. I am telling you, this is going to come. And once the lead delimitation, the proposed new delimitation, you must have seen the ideas floating around. If that also comes as a reality, a new parliament building to accommodate so many other people is already in place. Sengol is already taken there. And if that delimitation also comes, you can see a large part of India is marginalized. They are not going to have any political voice. So there is going to be large political marginalization and repression. 
economic marginalization and repression of states, regions as well as individuals and sections. Political representation is denied. People are being arrested for questioning. Evidence is being planted. Look at, look at, recall father, Stan Swami. Now, Stan Swami is arrested under UAP. So, Stan Swami will have to prove that he did not commit any offense or crime. It is not the burden of the prosecution, it is not the burden of the state or the government to prove Stan Swami has done something. No. It is he will have to show to the state that he has not done anything. Okay, fine. You have, you have, you have, you have asked him to prove. But you treated an individual because you did not like what, what the kind of work that he was doing. You subject him to such an inhuman treatment that eventually the man died. Somebody asked me, is it justified to treat a, a, a septuagenarian like that, an old person like that? I said, no, but there is no justification to treat even a young man like that. You think by treating a 30-year-old is justified? No, it's not justified. Leave alone, Stan Swami, leave alone anybody, even somebody who is in the 20s also cannot be treated in a human, civilized society. So, that is the kind of repression, that is the kind of marginalization that is bearing its fangs now. You, of course, hear a lot of othering remarks by people who support this kind of an ideology. There are calls for mass murder. There are calls for genocide. There are calls for economic boycott. There are calls for lynching. And there are actual lynchings. There are people who go around in places in Uttarakhand marking the houses so that tomorrow these houses are easily identifiable for, you know, for what? Nobody condemns it. The danger is this. Today, these things might appear marginal kind of a insignificant weak voices. But, let me caution you here. If this trend continues, I won't be surprised that tomorrow after 2024, these kind of a calls were given by the Prime Minister from the ramparts of Redfoot. I would be surprised. That is the danger we are all staring at. That is the kind of repression. That is the kind of marginalization. That is the kind of justification. The, the ultimate, ultimate justification is this for marginalization. That Hindus are good people. They are very benevolent. They are not aggressive. So, all other sections accept the superiority of the Hindus. They treat you well. They won't do anything bad to you. You just say that, okay, it's your country, let me also be there. Yeah. Let, me, let me be a second class citizen. They'll treat you well. Be assured, that is the kind of justification that we are hearing. That is the kind of justification that will be articulated much more clearly. Now it is only being whispered. There are so many people who tell you that. But tomorrow, this is going to be a main call. This is going to be a main focus a main thrust 
of the kind of political project which is treating the marginalized badly, increasing the number of marginalized, swelling the ranks of the marginalized, and those who think these people are marginalized and though these people can be repressed, people having that kind of an idea, the number of people having that kind of an idea is also increasing, is also rising. When there were 10 people before, as I said, Mohan, a driver from Rail Sima, is now also joining the ranks of those people who feel that, yes, these people are like that, let them be punished, let them be second class, or let them go away. This is the kind of marginalization and repression that we face today in this country, in the new India. Thank you very much.